I'm going to talk to you about uh, treat to target. You heard Steve mention that to you already, um, and also disease monitoring. And at the conclusion of my presentation, I hope that you'll have uh, a renewed approach to your patient population and, and a way to think about uh, how to manage them and how to incorporate this into your practice. So the idea is that the target moves. Um, that's one of my main take home messages. It's not just a fancy PowerPoint. Uh, in other words, achieving the target can be difficult for us, but also once you hit it, it's moving still. And that's part of what we have to understand better. Also, just put a plug in, if you're not following me on Twitter, you, you um, should consider doing so. Uh, I've been tweeting already from this meeting here my own editorial comments about our faculty speakers. Uh, I have some disclosures, not about them personally, about their science and the presentations to summarize. Okay, so you've already heard beautifully from Steve a nice introduction uh, regarding how our treatment strategies in IBD have evolved from the traditional step-up strategies in which patients had to fail one class or particular therapy before they move on, um, with the exception of understanding certain groups that we all tend to agree upon, right? The smoker with perianal disease and an intra-abdominal abscess we know is clearly a bad patient prognostically. But we um, are moving towards this evolving strategy that you saw some nice discussion about related to basing our decisions on prognosis. And we really have to be confident in our understanding of prognosis in order to do this and to be um, able to explain it to patients. So understanding what are the bad prognostic factors, um, such as needing steroids as opposed to just getting steroids, uh, and what happens to patients in whom we do not treat aggressively, and can we change the natural history of the disease by treating this way. So when we talk about what we're trying to do, we really are working towards the concept of optimal therapy. And so what you see across the bottom there is just a reference to Goldilocks, of course. We want to find something that's just right. We want the therapy to be started at the right time, and we don't want to wait too long so we lose our window of opportunity. And we don't want to use something too early where we might expose patients to risk that we were not intending. We would like to use the right dose that matches their disease intensity and their particular individualized pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenomics. We'd like to understand the interval regarding their maintenance uh, strategies and how to dose the therapies effectively so that the disease is truly under stable and durable control. And we'd also like to know how long to use our therapies. So we do have an active discussion and ongoing research now regarding the concept of de-escalation. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. And of course, we want to think about the right efficacy to safety ratio in the context of not just the therapy, of course, but also the ineffectively treated disease, which is the concept that often falls by the wayside among patients who go on the internet to read about the drugs that you've recommended, but don't necessarily know or understand or have been told what their prognosis may be. So our endpoints are evolving, and so are our treatment strategies. We um, shouldn't even have slides that have pyramids on them anymore. Um, but the step-up strategy on the right still applies to some of our patients. And I think, Steve, you get credit for having created this initially. The solid horizontal line refers to the induction strategy, which informs our choice of maintenance strategy, which is the hyphenated line to the right of it. And you'll see that we have our therapies sort of stacked upon one another, one after another, with the implication that they go up as the severity of the disease goes up. And once you're on a therapy, there's not really any dynamic image here to demonstrate what might change over time, which has been our traditional approach to all of this. Now, what's missing in this particular graphical demonstration is what happens over time from the standpoint of the disease changing and any allowance for understanding prognosis that might allow us to skip a few steps and start somewhere else. And you'll notice as well that I've intentionally labeled um, anti-integrin sort of floating in free space here because I think it's moving around. And we'll talk more about that perhaps with Dr. Kornbluth's presentation. So we have a number of problems with our existing treatment strategies. For the most part, they are reactive rather than proactive. And by waiting for complications or the quote unquote failure of therapy, we are allowing disease progression and we're allowing patients to suffer and have complications. Because of this, um, we end up with therapies being less effective, and we end up with more costly uh, care. So here's when people perk up, especially when you're talking to payers, is that when we tie together ineffective therapy, like requiring a second anti-TNF after the first one was a primary non-responder, 
we are in fact exposing the patient to the risk of progression and a must, much more likely costly outcome such as hospitalization, surgery, disability, and lost school and work, all of which are hard to measure. In addition, we've been stuck with the problem that every new therapy ends up as the caboose on the train of treatments. In other words, we wait till the new therapy's out and we add it to the end of the train and use it after everything else failed. Well, the challenge to doing that is that you're always setting up your patients to get the newest therapy who are the sickest or who have otherwise refractory disease. And I'll just refer you back to Peter's table on all the different reasons people have symptoms that are not inflammation-based. So we really need to be smarter about this. We need to start thinking about what we can do to use therapies earlier and to target specific mechanisms. So how can we do that? Well, for starters, we're going to focus more on choosing therapies based on prognosis. But you may say, well, I don't know really that this particular patient sitting in front of me has a worse prognosis than the next one. And my patient, by the way, won't let me prescribe what I'd like to prescribe. That happens all the time. And I'm going to give you an approach to that that we've published recently that you might find useful. The second thing is that we have to start using more validated objective endpoints. So by measuring the disease activity, it empowers not only you but the patient to understand whether the therapy you've chosen is doing what it's supposed to do. As I always tell patients, let's think about the risk of the therapy, yes, but let's prove that it works or doesn't work because this entire discussion and your fear may be moot after we realize the drug doesn't work and we're going to stop it in three months. It also incorporates the concept of adjusting therapies serially in some predefined way until you achieve some objective endpoint, or so-called treating to achieve a target, and optimizing the therapies to match the disease severity and the inflammatory burden. Now, how can we actually incorporate that into practice? Well, as you've already heard from Steve, we're trying to move towards these objective endpoints because we recognize that by doing so, we achieve better outcomes. And the outcomes of interest, of course, are the ones that not only make our patients feel better, but also can be better use of the limited resources available to us. So what is treat to target? Here's the example um, from rheumatology and their consensus statement published in 2010. The first thing to understand, and I think this is very important, is that it's a shared decision-making approach. In other words, this isn't just about you treating to achieve a target. It's about you and the patient together working to achieve a target. The second is it's not for everybody. We're not going to necessarily say everyone needs to achieve the target of healing their bowel. It's for the patients you deem to be higher risk. Who are the patients in whom this type of effort is going to be most effective or at least most needed? The primary goal is not just to achieve some objective target that may seem out of sync with how your patients feel. The primary goal is to maximize health-related quality of life, which they acknowledge, and we can say the same, um, requires controlling symptoms. Because if you don't do that, you're really not improving your patient's quality of life. But they also acknowledge that in order to do this, in order to achieve the target and to control the symptoms and prevent progressive structural damage, we must abrogate inflammation. We must turn off the inflammatory process. So that's how this all ties together. Shared decision making, higher risk patients, working together to identify not just symptom improvement and quality of life, but recognizing that the best way to do that over time is to turn off or control the disease process. Now that all sounds like motherhood and apple pie until you get into the details of how you actually try to do it. First, the question might be, what is the target? So in IBD, what should we be using? You heard from Peter and from Steve some ideas of what we're moving towards, but what can be the target? And I would argue and suggest that the target may be different in your different patients. In an individual patient who has an inch of proctitis, to go back to Steve's example, it may be that you want that patient to have their urgency go away. In somebody who has joint pain as their predominant extraintestinal manifestation, you may recognize that that should be a target for them. But you've got to pair that to some other measure that's going to guide you so that you understand. So in addition to urgency, which is a critical symptom, you might want to also say, well, I know that one of the most effective patient-reported outcomes in ulcerative colitis is bleeding from the rectum. So if the bleeding goes away and the symptom is better, I'm happy with both of those. That's just an example. And then you have to understand how do you measure it, how often should you measure it, and can you use surrogate markers to get away from doing something expensive like a scope or even needing to see them in the office quite as often.
So there's a publication that's now, um, I think the EPUB may be ready, but it's, it's been accepted into the Red Journal. Steve and I were both co-authors uh, on this. It's a consensus group that came together, and actually Steve was one of the senior authors, um, that uh, looked at what could be the targets in Crohn's and in UC. So 28 IBD specialists reviewed the available literature and voted on different targets. So here they are, maybe this is the first time you're seeing this. The recommendation in this consensus statement in ulcerative colitis was that there would be a patient-reported outcome of resolution of rectal bleeding and diarrhea or altered bowel habits and endoscopic remission as measured by the currently available Mayo score. Um, histologic remission was acknowledged by this group of experts as an adjunctive goal. And the Crohn's target was a patient-reported outcome of resolution of abdominal pain and diarrhea and altered bowel habits and endoscopic remission, which they acknowledged could be resolution of ulcerations on ileal colonoscopy or resolution of the findings of inflammation on cross-sectional imaging if the scope doesn't reach where you need to go or you can't do the procedure. Of importance was that the group, although interested in biomarkers like CRP and calprotectin, said that this would be an adjunctive target but couldn't be the primary target based on available evidence so far. So this is really important because this is going to guide some of our management and clinical trials going forward, uh, and I'm sure that Peter will be very involved in helping us understand it better. So can we do this treat-to-target strategy in IBD? Well, retrospective study from Bill Sanborn's group in California suggests that perhaps we can. So in all of his patients with ulcerative colitis, when he scoped them, if they had inflammation, he offered them the opportunity to adjust their therapy, whether that meant increasing the dose of what they were already on, which is an easy thing for us to do, or even jumping class to go up the ladder in that treatment option. If the patient agreed, they got counted in the group that was going to move towards the healing, and if they disagreed or he chose not to offer it for other reasons, they were in the group that was compared to them. So in this retrospective assessment of what he was just doing in his practice, he demonstrated that you could, with minimal adjustments, achieve not only mucosal healing through your scope, but histologic healing in many patients. And on average, it took two adjustments. So that means you scope them once, they had inflammation despite feeling pretty well, you offer them an adjustment like increasing their mesalamine, for instance, they say sure, they do it, and then he followed them up with another exam, and in some cases that wasn't sufficient to have healed them, and then he offered them the next step, which usually was going to a biological therapy, knowing Bill, um, and that meant that they then healed. Uh, so this demonstrates proof of principle, at least in a retrospective study from a single practice. Prospectively, there's a very large and very expensive trial that was funded by AbbVie that specifically tried to answer this. Now, this is something you may not have seen before. In IBD, this is a, um, a cluster randomization design. That means that instead of randomizing patients to one arm or another, they actually randomized centers to one approach or another. So one entire clinic would be randomized to using the algorithm that you can see there but don't have to read the details of, which is essentially a treat-to-target algorithm, versus the other clinic, which was randomized, and they said, just do whatever you do. And they wanted to know, could we achieve more remission, and could we change outcomes by doing a treat-to-target strategy in this huge study? 2,000 patients recruited from 40 centers around the world, and they followed these patients out for a little while. Please note that in red here, the primary endpoint was clinical remission. Now, you've already heard what we think about symptoms as a primary endpoint in clinical trials. So you could predict the outcome, which was that the primary endpoint was missed. There was no difference in using this complicated algorithm compared to what these folks were doing in their usual practice in the other centers. Um, and it may be because the patients weren't sick enough, which is one of the potential explanations that they offered to us. It may also be that there wasn't as strict following of the protocol in a variety of ways, which was also suggested. Um, but here's an interesting point. Aside from that clinical primary endpoint, which we acknowledge was probably a bad uh, endpoint to use, the secondary endpoints of hospitalization, surgery, or serious disease-related complications were fewer in the patients who did go through that treat-to-target algorithm. So it does suggest in a prospective, hugely expensive, complicated study design 
that we could, in fact, achieve better um, and more, I would argue, objective endpoints of uh, benefit by trying to get our patients to certain targets. And we could talk more about that, perhaps, if you're interested. Now, I'll also throw out to you that one of our other um, junior faculty here today uh, and I have published something recently looking at how you can use treat to target to help you in your patient discussions. So this is about using the same concept, but helping your patients know why they should go on therapy you're recommending, or embracing them to try what they want to try, which is often not our traditional strategies, like can't I just do diet for a month and see how I do? but using a more objective measure to show them whether or not they actually achieve the control they want when they are, in fact, um, trying this other approach. So you have your patient monitored in some way. You say, fine, go ahead and try this complementary approach, uh, and we will reevaluate your disease activity in four or six weeks and then have another discussion about adjusting your therapy. So a negotiated follow-up to reassess the disease ob objectively can empower both you and the patient to know that despite them feeling better on a gluten-free diet, their Crohn's disease is still very active and we should probably treat them with what we were recommending in the first place. So this way we can actually guide our patients down the path towards a target and empower them to understand how to do that. So we've been using that in our practice for a while and I think that's a very practical approach to this. So what about monitoring? Let's shift and talk about that for the remainder of my presentation. So whenever we think about recognizing the management of a chronic disease like IBD, we have to acknowledge as well that uh, treating to a target requires not just monitoring to get them to the target, but monitoring after you achieve the target. So there are five phases of disease monitoring. There's the pretreatment phase, the initial titration phase, the maintenance phase, to reestablish control when somebody loses their control, or in our field we call it relapse, and then the cessation phase. And that's what disease monitoring can be done, used for in your practice. So in IBD, it has many faces, and I'll give you a couple examples. In the pretreatment phase, what markers in your individual patient correlate with their disease activity? And can you then use those to guide you to get them into their treatment, which is the next phase, which is initial titration? What might you use to know whether whatever therapy you've chosen and your patients agreed will actually achieve the goal you want. And it's gonna be different in different patients. If they make CRP and it seems reliable, that's wonderful. If you're using fecal calprotectin for their colitis and it seems to be uh, available and the, the patient's insurance pays for it, great. But perhaps we also can think about some surrogates related to the drugs themselves, metabolites or drug levels. And then there's the maintenance phase. What markers can we use to monitor for disease drift or relapse, recognizing that chronic conditions have a tendency to drift out of control? So this, again, is the part that's been missing in all of our algorithms, is any acknowledgement of how things change over time. We always had these pictures of you just put them on therapy, and everyone in the room who takes care of patients knows that that's just not the real world. And then lastly, is this newer concept of cessation or de-escalation. And if you do de-escalate, and that doesn't always mean stopping therapy, but it might mean dose reduction, how do you monitor in that setting to know what's happening before the patient has a complication? So disease monitoring has evolved, and you've heard some beautiful presentations already today, but I'll just throw out to you a couple examples, um, and this could be a whole talk unto itself but fecal calprotectin, which is most reliable in the setting of colitis and correlates in its, um, in its numbers to the severity of the inflammation, and it's pretty reliable. Uh, and then, of course, different types of um, apps and dashboards that can collect patient-related information. Now, here's an example of how um, the research needs to occur to back up all this. This is a nice study from the University of Pennsylvania where they wanted to know, can we use fecal calprotectin to demonstrate that a change in therapy drives down the inflammation? A very simple question, but one that's critical, because even though you're sitting here and thinking, sure, I'd increase the mesalamine in my patient who had inflammation or continues to have problems, the reality is that we'd like to know, can you use a surrogate to help us do this without having to look with a scope? And what they demonstrated is, in fact, the calprotectin went down when they increased the mesalamine dose in these patients, 
but also very importantly, it had a um, better clinical outcome in the follow-up of these patients. So they demonstrated the use of this particular marker not only was sensitive enough to pick up a change when you adjusted the mesalamine, but also um, was an important thing to do because it demonstrated that the patients whose fecal calpro came down when their mesalamine went up also did better clinically. So this is a very nice paper by uh, Mark Osterman and colleagues that I think is now fully published and you should take a look at it. Then there's, of course, just what you do in clinical practice. You see the patient on whatever treatment you've recommended, and you want to ask them, are you truly stable? How are you doing in between your maintenance dosing of whatever therapy you're on? And reminding them that maintenance is about preventing relapse. It's not about catching up. You don't want your patient to say, I know when I need my infliximab, or I can tell two days before my adalimumab is due that I need it or whatever they're gonna say. I, I've had a flare three times in the last month. Well, you know, patients, what they call flares and what we call relapses are not always the same, and you have to go through all that with them. Emphasizing adherence and using our surrogate markers. So the therapeutic drug monitoring in IBD is another way to think about monitoring. And I've summarized it just in a few slides for you. And it's a complicated topic. But the first one is early assessment of drug le levels when you start loading biological therapies. So instead of waiting for you to load and then see if the patient's doing better and then find out later that they didn't respond, we now have some good evidence that week 14 trough levels are associated with stable remission out to a year. You could actually adjust your dose before the patient tells you that they're not doing as well three months down the road. And likewise, in ulcerative colitis, the infliximab concentration at week eight was associated with predictive outcomes out to a year. So should we be considering measuring a drug level early in our loading phase of these patients so that we can actually adjust the dose before they have a problem a few months down the road? And we've all faced that with our patients. In fact, it's part of my discussion. When I'm talking to a patient about starting a biological therapy, I tell them that 50 to 60% of patients who respond will be losing response by the first year. And that's a very important concept. So in my own practice, I will tell you that I've started using this in my higher risk patients so that I don't get behind the game in knowing whether I should have adjusted their dose. Because as you all know, it's much better to adjust your dose before they have a problem than after you're trying to catch up. We also, of course, know trough levels correlate to other things, such as mucosal healing and stable clinical response. Um, and there's been some evidence now to back this up. I wouldn't say that you should be doing drug levels in every patient every time they get a maintenance infusion, but I think in the field we're moving that way, and there will be a time when I think it's more affordable and can be incorporated. But there has been some research. This is a group from Boston at the Beth Israel Hospital, and Adam Shafitz, one of our colleagues, believed in doing this and checked his infliximab levels on his patients every time they came to see him. And he adjusted their dose to keep them within a range that he defined. Uh, and his outcome is the blue line on the survival curve. In other words, the patients in whom he pre-adjusted um, their doses and was proactive about were much more likely to stay on drug out to uh, two years than those in his partner's practice who were just being reactively dose adjusted. So it demonstrated the possibility that being proactive with your dose adjustments can keep patients stable on drug before they have a problem. And I think that makes sense to all of you. The reality is getting it into your practice and being able to afford it. So then what about de-escalation? The last concept that I'm gonna to introduce to you before I summarize. It has to do with the idea that we don't necessarily need to use the same amount of drug, which can be a lot of drug, for the maintenance phase once the disease burden is under better control or once the inflammatory burden is less. And the general concept would be, could we actually reduce our therapy in dose or even stop one of our drugs in some patients and then use less therapy over time but maintain the same amount of control, spend less money, and in theory have fewer complications? Well, we don't know a lot of variables here. How long should they be stable with higher intensity therapy before you de-escalate? How do you monitor after you de-escalate? But there are some ideas that have been um, thrown around, and in fact, this isn't such a new idea. When we use steroids to induce remission, we get them off steroids later. That's a de-escalation strategy. When we use therapeutic drug monitoring with infliximab, there is a study I'll show you that demonstrates you can reduce the dose. And when we use concomitant therapy with immunomodulators and anti-TNF, there have been a couple studies now that have tried to withdraw the TNF, 
or to withdraw the immunomodulator that suggests we might be able to do this. And a recent study uh, also has demonstrated that if you induce remission with a higher dose of 5-ASA and you achieve mucosal healing, you can maintain with a lower dose, which many in the room who are experienced say, well, we've been doing that for years. What took you so long to show us that it actually works? So this is the study that looks at reducing infliximab doses over time. There are two groups, the clinically-based dose adjustment group in blue and the trough-level-based dose adjustment group in yellow. And what you can see here is on the left, it did not improve the likelihood of achieving clinical remission if you used a level to adjust the dose. So there wasn't a statistical difference in those two groups. But on the right, you can see that if you continue to adjust the dose to keep the patients within a certain range, you were more likely to keep them well. So this is a, a more robust study of what was done at the Beth Israel group that demonstrated it's not about getting them well in the short term, but it may be about keeping people well in the long term, suggesting that this may be a way to think about this. And then the last point about this is can you use surrogates when you do de-escalate? And this is from the study in which patients on combo therapy with Crohn's had their infliximab stopped, but they stayed on their immunomodulator, which was mostly a thiopurine, and some patients on methotrexate. And the point of me showing you this is not to show you that you could stop the therapy, although you could. There were a variety of predictive variables about who would relapse, but I wanted to show you how they monitored the patient after they de-escalated. So once they stopped the infliximab, the nice thing about this study that I really liked is they used CRP and fecal calpro at serial intervals to try and find the patient who was going to have a relapse before they had a clinical relapse. And you can see that Calpro went up before CRP, but they both went up before the patient actually had symptoms. So if you de-escalate, if you decide to stop one of your therapies in a patient, and if you decide to reduce the dose of one of your therapies, I would strongly urge you to make sure you know that they have achieved biological control before you do so, and after you make your adjustment, you follow them very carefully with some monitoring strategy so you have a rescue therapy ready before they suffer a complication. Now, in my own practice, what I'm doing is that if I stop a therapy because they're mucosal, they have mucosal healing, um, and I don't leave people on nothing. I'm talking about combo therapy approaches. I then use a fecal calpro every three months for a year. And that's what we've been doing now. I'm, this is anecdote, but that's how I do it. And if they're stable over that year, then I've been doing it every six months subsequently. So we'll let you know if that works. So here's my proposed algorithm tying all of this together for you today. Start with your baseline assessment of the disease and pair it with some surrogate marker. So use your scopes, but find out if they make CRP, for instance, or if you can get and afford fecal calpro, great. Choose your initial therapy, not just based on severity, but based on prognosis. And after a defined interval of three to six months, reassess the disease using the surrogate or your gold standard of the scope. And if they've achieved whatever target you identified, and you can think about the different targets for your different patient groups, then you can continue in a cycle in which you now monitor the patient to make sure they stay under control, and that may be every six to 12 months. If they don't achieve the target, it goes back to a discussion with the patient about escalating or adjusting their treatment, and if they say, yes, I'll let you adjust the therapy, then you can do so, and you continue on in this loop until you get to your target. If the patient says, no thanks, or you run out of options, or you're not comfortable escalating, then you go into the clinical follow-up phase, which is essentially what we've been doing to manage IBD for 100 years. The concept here is that if you're in maintenance phase, monitoring your stable patient, this is where you can consider de-escalation. But you gotta be at the target before you talk about it, not just because the patient wants to. So the inner ring is the um, disease monitoring ring, and the outer ring is the treat to target ring. So this algorithm is something that you may say, well, that's what I do in practice already. But you might be surprised that if you actually incorporate this in a more strict way in terms of how you're going to follow up and what you're going to do and how you talk to patients, that it's going to be a lot more streamlined. And that's, in fact, how I've been doing it with my nurse practitioner. So um, I'll tease you with one last abstract and then wrap it up. Um, this is just from DDW, um, fecal calprotectin at home. So there's an at-home assay that's in development tied to a smart app. 
that would enable the patient using just colorimetric changes to know whether their fecal CalPRO is high, medium, or low, and whether or not they should alert you or make some other predefined disease adjustment strategy. Um, my only advice to you would be not to hold your patient's phone after they've been using this for a while. On the other hand, I think that uh, the concept of disease monitoring is coming, um, and allowing patients to do it at home will be here before you know it. And then we'll have something that's akin to diabetes management. We just now need to figure out what to, what to do with all these data and how we're going to capture it. So I hope that I've challenged you today to think a little differently about how we manage patients, not just from the standpoint of what we do to adjust therapies to hit targets, but also what we can do to discuss this with patients so that they can agree with us that they need to be on different therapies. We gotta move towards these objective endpoints, but focus still on symptoms and quality of life. And by monitoring our patients, we can keep an eye on them so that they don't drift away from control and also what to do when we de-escalate. Thank you very much.